Let me take you back to over a hundred years ago. Life back then was a whole lot different than it is today. Automotive technology was in its infancy, financial gain was rare, and war was a constant reality across Europe. You didn't watch TV, you'd listen to the radio. On the weekends you'd go dancing, and if you didn't die from the mumps during the night, the next morning you'd wake up and have cornflakes for breakfast. And you wouldn't post any of it on social media. Yes, life back then was a whole lot different. But Jared, it wasn't all glib because from 1908 to 1927, the very chassis of automotive history was being built with the literal blood, sweat, and tears that it took to build this, the 1913 Ford Model T. Hi, I'm Jared. And I'm Brad. And this week on Hood Slappers, we're gonna be reviewing the 1913 Ford Model T. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. The Ford Model T is more than just an automobile. It's a quintessential icon of what America stood for in the early 20th century. It transformed the way we travel and it became a token of the idealized average American worker. The Ford Model T was certainly not the first automobile ever produced, but it had the greatest impact on our society. Not because it was the fastest or even the most stylish, but because it was the cheapest. And I mean really cheap. As a matter of fact, in 1908, you could purchase a Ford Model T for a very respectable $850. And by 1927, the price was only as low as $260. Henry Ford wanted all his employees to be able to afford this car. It was the vehicle that your average worker couldn't afford not to own. And it was a smashing success. It first launched on October 1st, 1908 and ran all the way through 1927, selling more than 15 million cars. In fact, it was the longest running car in production until 1972 when the Volkswagen Beetle took it over. In the early 20th century, if you knew someone who had a car, chances are they were driving a Ford Model T. In fact, it became so important to the American economy that the city this was built in, Detroit, became known as Motor City, and it spawned a massive automotive manufacturing sector that still exists today. So, let's take a look under the hood. This Model T was built with a four-cylinder, 2.9-liter inline flathead engine that produces a very respectable 22 horsepower. That's more horsepower than a Twizy 45 and only three horsepower less than the original Volkswagen Beetle. The engine, as brilliant as it was at the time, was assisted by a planetary band two-speed transmission. This is what makes the Ford Model T so hard to drive as it uses three pedals and none of them work the way you think they might. A few extra perks of purchasing the 1913 Ford Model T were brass headlights, a windshield, and a radiator. It doesn't seem like much, but it still has more options than Brad's 2010 Corolla. This particular Model T, being the touring car body style, means you have room for four people, and because it's a 1913, it means you get complete leather seats. Touring car also means there is no fixed roof. Compared to today's cars, the Model T might look fragile and delicate, but make no mistake, Henry Ford was poised to make not only an affordable car, but a durable one. He himself would set the gauntlet for the Model T and see its success through. You see, it's important to remember that in the early 1900s, most of the roads were made of dirt and built for the more popular horse and carriage rather than the automobile. We didn't have those fine, smooth roads that we have today. Well, except for Michigan. A proud Henry Ford was to be the first to test his car, and he put it through the ultimate test and completed two major feats of strength to affirm its durability. First, he drove it up the steps of the Tennessee State Capitol, and then he managed to drive to the top of Pikes Peak, which subsequently became famous for its international hill climb in 1916. The Model T passed with the same flying colors that you couldn't purchase the vehicle in, and the rest, as they say, was history. Now, what made Mr. Ford and his Model T so successful was the creation of the moving assembly line, because this allowed Mr. Ford to save time on production costs. Now, we all know time is money, but exactly how much time and money did this save Mr. Ford? Well, consider this, assembly of the Model T 
could take 12 hours, but with the moving assembly line, it moved down to a mere 90 minutes, an hour and a half to make this. And that's what made the Model T so much more affordable than the average automobile. Ford's very first moving assembly line was launched December 1st of 1913. What's really cool about this 1913 is it was built at the end of 1912, predating the moving assembly line by one year. The system they used for this was called the craft system. You would take the frame, you would put it on a sawhorse like this, and then you would bring the parts to the vehicle then to be assembled. Here's an interesting fact. Many of those parts were actually built by the Dodge brothers. That is until Mr. Ford wanted full control, then he bought them out and used strictly Ford parts. You know, it's a shame. I wonder whatever happened to those Dodge brothers. What are you doing? It's a sawhorse. It's a sawhorse. <laughs> you know, like a horse. All right. This is interesting stuff, and we have raised the bar once again, because you see, not only are we reviewing a car, we're giving our viewers a history lesson. My goodness, if my ex-girlfriend could see me now. Right, well, we've talked enough about the car. I think now it's time to take it for a drive. Ah, uh, Jared, here's the thing. I am owed one car drive, and I have decided that the car I would like to drive is this one. No can do. What do you mean, why not? It's always no with you. Let me show you. See, Brad, this doesn't work like your car or my car. The planetary transmission that Ford used is a lot different than anything you've driven today. And the planetary transmission is very old. Well, how old is it? It's so old that nobody knows exactly where it came from, but Ford certainly mastered it. As a matter of fact, it remained unchanged for up to 19 years. And this one was designed by Joseph Gallum. It took him a year to design it in a top secret location. And here's how it works. The left pedal, you push it forward to enter into first gear, then release the pedal all the way to enter into second gear or top gear. Center pedal, this acts as a reverse pedal. There is no gear selecting stick. Selecting this pedal means that you're going in reverse. The right pedal, this is your brake pedal. Now it's about as effective as dragging your feet along the side of the car, but when your top speed is only 40 miles per hour, I think you'll be okay. So are you telling me you're driving this? Unfortunately not. Harry, our public relations manager, says that nobody would entrust such a historical vehicle to, and I quote, a couple of boobs. Harry said that. Harry said that. How about us? How about us? Huh. Well, let's take it for a spin. Uh, Brad, before we do that, anytime you see one of these old movies with a Model T, they're always wearing some sort of period-appropriate goggles. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't have any of those, so unfortunately we're left with, uh, well, with these. Oh, well, I'll, ta I'll take these. No, ones this then. one's actually for you. <sighs> now, the process of starting a Model T is an event in and of itself. So we have asked an expert to join us and show us how to start this vehicle. I want you to meet Darren, the owner of this 1913 Ford Model T. Now, anytime you ask a classic car owner a question about a vehicle, they always go off and talk for a very long time. So we brought our stopwatch. Anytime you go over the time limit, we will let you know, Darren. So let's get things started and let's start this guy up. We going swimming, guys? First thing we're gonna do is make sure that the spark lever is all the way up. We certainly don't wanna break our arm trying to start it. I had a friend once and he didn't do that. And he was- Darren, Darren. Then we turn the battery on. Now we're gonna crank. Then we switch to magneto so we don't waste our battery. very special car this in particular one anybody can own an old car that's cool in and of itself what makes this vehicle unique and extra cool is that the owner Darren knows the complete history of it for example this was built in October of 1912 yes it was built in Walkerville Ontario which is now Windsor and it was sold in November of 1912 in Tavistock Ontario to a man named John Horman who lives in Shakespeare, Ontario. And I bet this looks just as good as it did the day it was built and rolled off the lot. 
Now, Darren, I want to know myself, how long have you owned this car for? I've only owned it since uh, 2018. It's been in the Wallace family since 1956. My brothers and I played in this car when we were little kids. Oh. And it was in a barn at my grandfather's uh, property for approximately 64 years. So how many how many owners has it had? Technically two families. Wow. It was owned by John Horman. His daughter owned it for a little while, so it stayed in the Horman family. And then my grandfather bought it in 1956 and it stayed in the Wallace family ever since. Wow. So is that is that rare to have a car this old and know that much history on it? Very rare. Yeah. Very few Model T's or any antique cars for that matter would have any provenance since new. Wow. Very rare. Jared, we should drive this to John and let him see his car. Wouldn't that be I'm sure he'd love to see the old car. Brad, that's ridiculous. John lives in Shakespeare. That's miles away. Okay, okay, okay good point. But you know, truth be told, if we did drive this, it would take us almost all night to get there. And you don't want to be driving this at night because the headlights are certainly not the high-tech LED lights we've come to know and love about our cars today. That's very true. That's very true. Now, there's no electric lights on this car. The uh, headlights are activated with uh, acetylene for fuel. Now, where do you get acetylene from? Well, this little device here is called a carbide generator. In the top of it is a tank of water with a drip control. In the bottom, there is a basket for calcium carbide. And when the water drips on the calcium carbide, the gas is created from a physical reaction which goes through this rubber tube, comes up here through these rubber hoses for both headlights. You open the door, light it with a match, and your headlights are good to go. Aside from the acetylene headlights, there are three oil lamps on this car. Two are on the firewall, or the cowl, and this little guy here is our tail light. And they are all three are filled with kerosene. And you open the little door, light it with a match, close the door, and you're good for night driving. Acetylene is also an asphyxiant, which is interesting. My landlord had that. But here's the thing, it can be incredibly dangerous. It doesn't bode well for the everyday driver, okay? Because here's the thing, it can make you feel a little lightheaded, a little nauseous. So let's say you're driving to a party at night, if you don't run off the road because of the headlights, you might show up to the party, you know, a little bit, you know, woohoo, not feeling quite yourself, a little lightheaded. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, speaking of explosives, gasoline. This tank is a 37 liter tank. And to give you an idea and context, it has the same fuel economy as an all wheel drive Kia Sportage. Okay, now here's a question, Darren, that I want to know, and I'm sure every viewer, well, it needs to be corrected on because I, I, you've corrected me. This Model T, it did not only come in black. It was never black when it was new. What? What color was this new? This car was midnight blue. Wow. Well, midnight blue, black. It's close. Yeah. Model T's in Canada and the U.S. were color coded by body style until as late as 1915. Uh, especially in Canada. In the States, they were painting them just black in 1914 with the moving assembly line. Tourings were blue, roadsters were gray, early 1909-1910 tourings were red, Londolais wow. were green, uh, and then again in 1926, a half a dozen colors were offered huh. with all models. Wow. And the 26 and 27s were called the improved for it as a result. So that whole only black, that's not true? It's not true. Interesting. It, it is true that Ford did paint them black, but Henry Ford never said that. He made a statement. You can get it in any color as long as it's black. Never yeah. happened. Well, that's good to know. So there you go, viewers. Now you know. Now, we Canadians and Americans have always had our differences. For instance, we Canadians use the metric system, Americans use the imperial system. We Canadians spell colour with a U, Americans spell it wrong. The list goes on and on and was no different with the Model T. You see, the Canadian version of the Model T came with four doors, including a driver's side door, whereas the American version only had three doors because the driver's side door was a false one. It was pressed in on sheet metal. 
Now, this isn't because Canada thought, well, we better give the driver a door. No, this is because these were also produced in Canada for New Zealand, Australia, and England. And over there, they have right-hand drive cars, which made these all ambidextrous. Ooh, my cousin has the ambidextrous. I can relate. What? Now, Garrett, you also just told us a very interesting piece of history about this car, and it had the first ever what? This car sports the first ever vehicle recall. The 1913 body style is very unique to itself, in which the doors extend down to the splash aprons, and that made the body very weak. And with a full load in the back, the back doors would actually fall open while it was uh, in motion because the back doors open like a suicide door. So Ford had to make a reinforcement brace for each side of the body, and Mr. Horman, when he bought this car new, he would have had to have taken it to the closest Ford agent, probably where he bought it, and have those reinforcing brackets installed. Later in 1913, the brackets were just installed at the factory. But it was indeed the first ever vehicle recall in history. It's pretty hot. Hey, Brad, can we get the air conditioning going here, Darren? <laughs> Now, we posted on our social media that we would be reviewing the 1913 Ford Model T, and we opened it up to our viewers so that they could ask some questions from the driver, Darren. Now, we are gonna do exactly that in a segment that we're calling Q&A with B&J. We're not calling it that. Now, here's some questions from our viewers directed at you, Darren, and the clock is ticking with each answer. Breadcrumbs.co asks, original MSRP, and what is the commonly yelled out comment from fellow motorists? This particular car new was $600, FOB Detroit. And uh, the most common thing I get yelled at me is nice ride. For every nine thumbs up, I get one middle finger salute. Well, Brad gets those all the time, don't <laughs> worry about that. Next question comes from Matt at BW Waterloo, and he asks, what does this cost to maintain? Well, when it's running properly, really just gas and oil. Uh, the nice thing is, is that the majority of Model T part can be bought as replicas. The only thing you really can't buy new is engine blocks. Uh, now, they're not Ford-made parts, but they are Ford-licensed parts by a few various old car distributors uh, throughout the United States and one in Canada, actually. Johnny Mac, 0831. Johnny Mac, thrown out to you here. He wants to know, does it do burnouts? Uh, in the snow, it could. I'd say yes. But unfortunately, <laughs> you have wood wheels, which even though are in really good condition and safe, if you lose a wheel accidentally, it could have catastrophic result rolling the car. Wouldn't be a good idea. And Studio Allison asks, does it have cup holders or something that could work as a makeshift cup holder? That's funny because uh, of the tens and thousands of accessories that were made for the Model T, cup holders were never one of them. And she <laughs> follows up with, how comfortable are the seats? They're not bad. It's better than an orange crate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what, uh, what's under these seats? What's under the leather? Uh, it's the, the seats are actually tufted with horse hair, real horse hair. Okay, real horse hair. <laughs> and this is real leather? It is real leather. Very cool. Giddy up, eh? Yeah, all right, now are we done with those? <laughs> you know, I gotta say, it's pretty comfortable back here, Darren. And the leg room here is phenomenal. You'll never find this much leg room in the second row, any modern car. Well, I know it doesn't look like it, but I am quite comfortable up here as well. Yeah, with guys, Darren. Uh, yeah nice and comfy, eh? Uh, quite comfortable, yes, uh -huh. thank you for asking. Now, another very important question here. Uh, Darren, do you wish I was up front with you instead of Darren? <laughs> Brad, you, you belong back there. You look good. You got well, I tell you, it's space. very comfortable. It's very spacious. And are you part of any club, Model T club? Or are you yeah. a lone wolf? No, there's uh, quite a few clubs, actually. There's uh, the Model T Club of America. There's the Model T Club International. We also have the Horseless Carriage Group for pre-1916 automobiles. And there's the Heritage Antique Automobile Society of Canada. Too many clubs and not enough time sometimes. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> well, if you're a part of one of those clubs and you like this video, by all means, you're more than welcome to like and subscribe. And hopefully we can review some more videos or some more vehicles like this one here, because this is pretty cool. And this is a big piece 
of automotive history. So Darren, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I truly mean that. Thank you for letting us uh, take your entire Sunday <laughs> and driving this car, and uh, thank you for not killing us oh. in a car that uh, doesn't have the best brakes and a lot of explosive qualities to it. So this is, this is really cool. I really appreciate this. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. The Model T came at a very important time in history, a time when Western civilization was still in its infancy but gearing up to be an economic superpower. When Henry Ford introduced the Model T, what he didn't realize is that he wasn't just creating a car, he was building the very foundation upon which modern day Western civilization is built upon. The West embraced the car with open arms, creating road networks, highways, and rethinking of city planning our world would look very different without the Model T. Henry Ford created the vehicle moving assembly line, profit sharing, and a great car. But more than that, he gave the average person true freedom. For the first time ever, the average person had the freedom to go anywhere at any time. Today's world owes so much to this car and its creator. The automotive landscape was a lot different today than it was over 100 years ago when the Model T first came out. With the rise of fuel prices, the cost of vehicles, and now the introduction of the electric car, automotive manufacturers will once again have to step up to the plate and ignite those engines of innovation to adapt to what's coming. We know that the Model T is a great vehicle, and we can only hope that these new steps in the future of the automotive world will be just as powerful and as prominent as the Model T was way back then. We already know that this vehicle has cemented its place in history. So with that, I give the 1913 Ford Model T my hood slap of approval. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.